Good afternoon, good evening, good morning to the people in Australia. Maybe it's already afternoon there. Great to have you. I'm Janice Kamener Resnick, and on behalf of our leadership team, former Congressman Mel Levine, Xavier Oslovsky, and myself, I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's program. Welcome and thank you to today's guest, the prolific Rick Hassan of UCLA Law and his recent book. We're excited to hear about it. I hope you can all see this. It's called The Real Right to Vote, How a Constitutional Amendment Can Safeguard American Democracy. And thanks to our always wonderful moderator, Larry Mantle. Next Wednesday, the 28th of February, we'll dig deeply into politics with two of the most experienced and respected political analysts around. That's Democrat Bob Schrum and Republican Mike Murphy in conversation with Pat Morrison talking about 2024 election year update. It's anything but business as usual. Bob is the director and Mike is the co-director of the Center for Political Future at USC. It'll be a great program, very lively, I'm sure. The following week on March 6th, we welcome Rabbi Sharon Brous, a founder and senior rabbi of ECAR, a Jewish congregation in Los Angeles. ECAR has repeatedly been named one of the nation's 50 most innovative Jewish uh, nonprofits. And also Rabbi Brous has repeatedly been named one of the most influential American Jews and one of the most influential rabbis in America. She wrote a recent book calling The Amen Effect, uh, Ancient Wisdom to Mend Our Broken Hearts in the World, based on certain of her exceptional sermons. The book grapples with all of the issues we're dealing with, like loneliness, isolation, social rupture, and alienation. So we hope that you will join us. Their moderator will be Madeline Brand. It's sure to be an inspirational program. In honor of President's Day this week, I offer the following. Uh, the 2024 Presidential Greatness Project Expert Survey. I didn't know there was one, but there is. It was conducted from November 15th to December 31st, and it included current and recent members of the President's and Executive Politics Section of the American Political Science Association. These are all scholars um, of, of American presidents. It's the foremost organization of social science experts in presidential politics, probably in the universe. Uh, and the experts ranked Abraham Lincoln as America's greatest president. By the way, Biden was number 14th, and I probably don't have to tell you who came in last place. Uh, while President's Day started out initially honoring George Washington's birthday, by the 1960s, it went much broader to honor all presidents, but the two who are most associated with President's Day are Washington and Lincoln. So in the spirit of the 16th president, who was, and I believe has always been ranked number one by most annual surveys on that subject, I will share with you the final paragraph of Lincoln's second inaugural address, which was delivered on March 4th, 1865. Reportedly, John Wilkes Booth was in the audience that day of that, uh, of that second inaugural address, um, and he heard the address, and six weeks later, he would assassinate President Lincoln on April 15th, 1965, only six days after what was considered the official ending of the Civil War. It is well known that President Lincoln had many highly memorable, venerated speeches, which are foundational to the principles of American democracy and freedom, not the least of which was the Gettysburg Address, but many feel that his second inaugural address, which was in total only 750 words, was his greatest speech. As a tribute to President Lincoln and to President's Day, here is the final president of his inaugural address. Some of you know it by heart. With malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to, the, to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him, who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. In that spirit and through our work, by the way, that was the end of the quote, of course, uh, this is now me speaking. And in that spirit, through our work, we too continue the task referenced by Lincoln. Our task, we believe, is of more importance than ever during this particular presidential election year because of the grave threats posed to our democracy and to our country. In the spirit of President Lincoln and others, we fight on and persevere. Now, please welcome our ever popular and ever wonderful award-winning broadcast journalist and moderator, Larry Mantle. Larry has been the host of Air Talk with Larry Mantle on NPR member station LAist, formerly known as KPCC since April 1, 1985. Air Talk is the longest running daily talk show in Southern California, and it's all because of Larry. So now I give you Larry Mantle. Larry? Janice, thank you so much. And uh, it's just such a pleasure to be with you all again. My thanks to 
to Mel and to Zeb as well for having this opportunity to join you for these regular Wednesday evening programs. I come away from them learning so much and so many of these topics are ones I'm talking about regularly on our daily program air talk that Janice just mentioned. But there's something about this format of a full hour, including the terrific viewer questions, which add so much to these programs that I think make them so educational and, and so exciting to be a part of. And, and I trust that tonight will be very similar with our wonderful guest. Uh, Rick Hasten, of course, who is a foremost legal authority. Uh, I think uh, no one is equal when it comes to election law. He specializes in that area and is professor at UCLA School of Law, also professor in political science. So that comes together with his legal acumen. He directs UCLA Law's Safeguarding Democracy Project. He's written a number of influential books, including the one that we focus on this evening. He also runs the election law blog in which uh, so many different uh, important points are raised about the state of election law in America and court interpretation of those laws. His new book, as uh, Janice just said, is A Real Right to Vote, How a Constitutional Amendment Can Safeguard American Democracy. Professor Hassan, welcome back to America at a Crossroads. Uh, I've had the honor of being able to talk with you for decades now, and it's great to have this opportunity for your new book. Oh, it's so great to be with you and back with this group. Uh, I do want to say that uh, my condolences to everyone in the community for the loss of David Lehrer. I mean, it's a little odd. This is my first time coming back since uh, he's gone, and I miss him, and uh, his leadership lives on uh, in the work that uh, Mel and Janice and Zev are continuing to do. Yeah, and I, I, we all appreciate that so much because his presence is really felt with every one of these programs, such an instrumental part in establishing of what these programs are really centered about and, and the themes that we talk about. So before we get into what you think this amendment you're proposing would fix, what is the gist of it? What are the most important pieces of what this amendment would spell out? Well, I think the first place to start is to say that most people who are not lawyers and, and even some people who are lawyers would be shocked to learn that the Constitution does not actually guarantee a right to vote to anyone. If you go back and look at the original Constitution, state legislatures chose the president, state legislatures chose the senators, and who was allowed to vote for um, House of Representatives? Whoever was qualified to vote in state elections. And if you look through American history, we had amendment after amendment uh, dealing with voting rights that that mostly framed amendments that uh, mostly framed voting rights in the negative. So if you're going to hold an election, don't discriminate on the basis of race or on the basis of sex. And so uh, we are unlike the rest of our peer countries. You look at other advanced democracies in their constitutions, which are newer than ours, not coincidentally, they guarantee a right to vote. And so lots of problems flow from the fact that we don't have that affirmative right to vote. And throughout American history, people have had to fight. And in the book, I tell the stories of people who had to fight for their right to vote, going to the Supreme Court and often losing. And in fact, having to go to uh, political battles. And so really the first thing I'm trying to do in the amendment, it does, I think, six different things. But the, the number one thing is a basic point of political equality. If you're a citizen, you're adult, you're a resident, you're not uh, anyone with a felony conviction, you should be entitled to vote uh, in uh, all elections uh, that are being held where you are a resident in the area. You know, uh, you know so many uh, people in this country hold to the view that the states having the degree of control that they do in many things is, is our advantage, that that's actually a better model than other democracies where so much power is held in the federal government. So what's your response to those who would say it is better for the states to control this? It is better for the states within the limits of the, const the federal constitution to, to uh, really have the final say? Well, so I think we need to draw a distinction between how much power states have compared to the federal government on issues of policy and um, uh, issues of um, uh, allocation of resources, things like that, and who gets to vote. Uh, when it comes to voting, uh, the whole idea of uh, we the people, 
the whole uh, idea that comes out of, if we think back to the one person, one vote cases of the 1960s, is that we're all political equals. Uh, one of the things I talk about in the book is uh, we treat American citizens in terms of their voting rights differently depending on where they live. So if you live in uh, Guam or you live in um, Puerto Rico, uh, you can't vote for a president. Uh, you can't vote for the House, and yet you're a citizen. It's even worse if you live in American Samoa, and uh, if you move to the United States from Puerto Rico, you can vote while, while you are a resident of a state, but not if you come from American Samoa, because they are American nationals and not citizens. Uh, it's kind of a hodgepodge. And in some states, it's much easier to vote than in others. So one of the examples I talk about is North Dakota, which for some reason, and I think I know what the reason is, adopted a rule that you need to provide a residential street address if you want to be able to vote. That was a law that was targeted at Native American voters. Most other people who were voting in North Dakota had a street address. But if you were poor and lived on an Indian reservation, you wouldn't have one. We shouldn't have such a patchwork of things. It's fine to say that we're going to let states decide certain issues and, you know, uh, we might have different rules on uh, gun rights or on abortion or however we're going to divide power. But in terms of who is going to elect our leaders on the national and the state level, I don't see any, there's no benefit to letting states shape who the, is in the electorate. How would uh, an amendment that, that explicitly details a right to vote then guide federal courts as they decide potential infringements on the right? Right. So one of the things that uh, I detail in the book, the, the Supreme Court's in, in its mostly in its current form has been around for about 235 years. And for about uh, 228 of those years has been kind of hostile to voting rights. It was only a narrow period in the 1960s when the Supreme Court actually expanded voting rights. The so Warren the book, Court. Uh, what's that? The Warren Court you're speaking yes, of? Yes, that's right. The, yes, and, and only a, only part of the time of the Warren Court. In 1959, uh, uh, Earl Warren was on the court when they upheld literacy tests. Uh, hard to believe that is still a good precedent uh, uh, from the United States Supreme Court. It's only because we have part of the Voting Rights Act, a federal statute, that literacy tests are illegal in this country. If that statute were overturned by the Supreme Court, we could see literacy tests again. In Bush versus Gore, the Supreme Court, that's just the case in 2000 that ended the dispute over the Florida election and, and the election in, in the country. The Supreme Court reminded us, you have no constitutional right to vote. Uh, it's this is a right that state legislatures choose to give to the people, and they can take it back at any time. I mean, I think people will be shocked to learn that, too. So one of the things that's different about my proposed amendment is that I don't trust the Supreme Court. Uh, I think we need to give them specific directions as to how they would have to weigh the burdens and benefits of voting. It's, it's a little bit technical, but for the most part, when someone challenges a voting rule, like that rule I described about having a residential street address, the Supreme Court has articulated a test that puts a big thumb on the scale favoring the state. The state doesn't have to come forward with any evidence to justify its rules. They could say it's preventing fraud or it's promoting voter confidence, but voters have to show that they face a really big burden when uh, these uh, laws are imposed. And if they can only show a small burden, well, tough luck. And so one of the things I would explicitly do is flip that and put a thumb on the scale favoring the voters. Uh, you lay out, I just wanted to say, so many fascinating cases in the book, the history of election law that you just, you, sort of a primer of these cases that you're talking about and how the different courts interpreted constitutional protections uh, is absolutely fascinating. I learned so much uh, in the book, just as you prefaced what you see as the need for this. You write that the amendment would curtail litigation, but that's not quite clear to me because it sounds like, in, in you're talking about the thumb on the scales that really gives people more redress to federal courts, that this could open up the floodgates to litigation over election law. How would, how would it impact that? Sure. So I think that, um, you know, one of the things I would do, aside from giving uh, all of these people a constitutionally protected affirmative right to vote, uh, is that I would make the states have to register all voters. And if a state didn't want to do that, they could let the 
federal government do it. Just like if you think about Obamacare, states have to establish these exchanges to sell health insurance. If they don't want to, the federal government can take it over. And the federal government will be responsible for coming up with unique ID numbers that would apply to each voter that would travel with you. So if we had universal voter registration and a way when people move from state to state to know who they are um, so that we wouldn't have double voters or the potential for double voters, this would eliminate a great deal of the litigation. So I've been tracking election litigation since the 1990s. The amount of election litigation we have has nearly tripled in the post Bush versus Gore period compared to the period before. And much of that uh, litigation is about things like um, the voter registration rules. And so certainly if this amendment passed, um, there would be an initial period where there would be a lot of questions. But once things shook out, I think we would see a decline in litigation. And so if you think back to that example I gave about the North Dakota residency requirement, the state would have such a hard time justifying such a law in the absence of any proof that uh, there, were there were ineligible voters who were voting or people voting twice, that they would quickly lose their cases in court. And eventually there, there would be no benefit to trying to impose such laws because they would be struck down. Um, it, it is uh, something that would depend upon uh, not just voters bringing lawsuits, but in another part of the amendment, I say that the court would have to recognize Congress's great power to enforce voting rights. And this is very different than what we saw in 2013, when the Supreme Court in the Shelby County versus Holder case struck down a key part of the Voting Rights Act. That kind of not giving Congress its ability to more greatly enforce voting rights would be gone under this amendment. Uh, speaking of that uh, unique ID that voters would have in the country, you know, under uh, various immigration reform measures that we've had in the country, there's the whole E-Verify process to determine that someone can legally work in the United States. And that's something that uh, immigration rights activists have really fought because of concerns about confusion over the names and numbers that could go to the to the wrong person, but who has a name that is identical or almost identical to someone else. How would you avoid the kind of problems with a voter ID number that immigration rights people point to under E-Verify? Right. So uh, this is, in fact, why I think that my, this is the one aspect, I think, of my proposal that will uh, and is already getting some pushback from the left rather than uh, some of the pushback I've been getting from the right, which is that um, we don't have a national uh, uh, identity card in this country. And again, if you look at most other countries, this is one way that they're able to run their elections is they already have this. Now, we have Social Security numbers, but Social Security numbers are given to people who are um, not citizens. And also, Social Security numbers uh, don't come with uh, with any kind of photographic identification. Uh, so this would have to be a system that would be rolled out, uh, and it would have to be done in a way consistent with the amendments so that no one would be disenfranchised in the interim. Uh, it certainly would uh, provide a benefit to voters in terms of giving them another form of identification. The problem with voter ID laws today is not the concept of identifying. We we identify voters in California that generally by signature, um, but uh, you know there's always some form of identification. The problem is in some states that the kinds of identification that are acceptable are very narrow and they tend to be discriminatory. So in Texas, if you have a concealed weapons permit, that's okay as an ID, but not a college uh, student identification card, not acceptable. I talk a lot in the book about discrimination by Texas and other states against college students. So we'd have a very different kind of system than we'd have now. But I, you know, I'm under no illusions that that aspect of it would have to be done in a very careful way. And it could have some collateral effects in other parts of the law. And that would have to be worked out for sure. Uh, you have a number of cases where you think courts have got it wrong on election law. But of course, there'd be people you know, on the other side would feel like the courts are doing a pretty good job of handling this. Um, how how would this, if it would, sort of depoliticize the process of federal court review of election issues? I don't know that it would depoliticize it as much as, uh, as I said earlier, putting a thumb on the scale. And I think at this point, it's worth, let me tell just a couple of those stories of people who um, sure. were disenfranchised by the court. So back in 1874, uh, a white adult woman from Missouri 
named Virginia Minor went to the Supreme Court and said, we've just uh, passed the 14th Amendment. It guarantees all citizens the privileges or immunities of citizenship. I'm not allowed to vote because the state constitution in, in Missouri says only men can vote. And she said, this violates the constitution. And the Supreme Court said, sorry, um, you are a citizen, which is better than how they treated African-Americans at the time, that you are a citizen, but you do not get uh, the, this is not a privilege or immunity of citizenship. This is a question of state law. And it took until 1920 uh, through political organizing in the states to get the 19th Amendment to bar discrimination and voting on the basis of gender. Even worse than that, in 1903, a black Alabama male citizen went to the Supreme Court, a man named Jackson Giles, and he said, we passed the 15th Amendment after the Civil War. It says no discrimination in voting on the basis of race. And I've been uh, denied the right to register to vote because I'm black. And this is unconstitutional. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, that is true that that's what the amendment says, but there's nothing we can do about it. Right. So this is the approach that the courts have generally taken. This is a politicized choice. The court could have read these uh, amendments in a more pro-voter uh, way. So one more story. In uh, 1960s, uh, there was a sergeant in the army uh, named uh, Herbert Carrington. He moved from Alabama, where he was stationed. He got stationed in White Sands, New Mexico. He moved his family to El Paso, Texas, set up a side business while he was there. Kids were in school, and he went to vote in the uh, went to register to vote in the Republican primary and was told he wasn't eligible because the state constitution said, if you're in the military, unless you were already a uh, resident of Texas, you cannot vote. And they, the, Carrington went all the way to the US Supreme Court. And this time the US Supreme Court, this was in that narrow period of the Warren Court said, that's right, you have the right to vote under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And one of the arguments Texas had made was, if we allow military voters to vote, they might change the outcome of the elections. Because they're moving me, around all the that, time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, they made two arguments. One was these are, you know, itinerant. These are not residents. But someone like Carrington had been living there and would be living there for years. Uh, but they also said if you allow military voters to vote, they'd swamp the votes of kind of the real voters, the local voters. And to me, this is a feature, not a bug of democracy. It is, in fact, true if you allow all residents to vote that the outcome of elections may not be what you want them to be. Well, how how then could you exclude people that are in penitentiaries, for example, from voting? If you say that there is a constitutional right for every person to vote, how do you exclude those people serving serving sentences? Right. So this is a, um, a, a place where I draw a distinction. So I, in the book, I draw a distinction between what I would call the basic amendment, the one that would kind of lock in the protections we have today. And then I have some additional amendments. So today, it's under the precedence of the Warren Court, there's at least formally recognition for citizen adult resident non-felons to have a right to vote. But, uh, and so I want to at least lock that in. And I, as I wrote this amendment, I was trying to think, what would be the minimum that would be an advantage that could still get support from potentially from the left and the right? But then in these additions, the first one is uh, people who um, were former felons, uh, people who have finished their sentences. And I think in all but eight states, when, uh, when someone has finished their uh, sentence, their voting rights are restored. In some states, it remains very, very difficult. And I tell the story in Florida how after Florida voters on a bipartisan basis passed an initiative uh, re-enfranchising felons when they finished their sentences, the state legislature and the governor worked against it. And so now it effectively does not re-enfranchise. So I'm in favor of, at least for those who uh, have completed their sentences, to be able to vote. But as a very basic point, I leave that up to the states. My initial view was, better for this to be politically de decided by each state because we were moving in the direction of reenfranchisement, recognizing that the criminal justice system is, is quite warped and um, ends up uh, capturing a lot of people uh, and, and punishing them uh, way too harshly. So, uh, so uh, 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 if, if, and of course that's a debatable public issue that the, sure. you know, the electorate weighs in on, right. but uh, if, if, if you make a carve out like that though, 
does doesn't that in some way weaken this overall protection that you're attempting to re create for a human right to vote? Sure. Or is it well, just like age? Is it is it it does it have the same stand standing as no one under 18? Right. So the question is, are you going to draw what lines are you going to draw? And every if you look around the world, every jurisdiction draws lines. One of them is adulthood. Uh, uh, one of them in most places is citizenship. And we can argue about whether citizenship should be a requirement. Some places allow for local school board elections, non-citizens to vote. Another one is residency. I'm sure that you would love to have the chance to be able to vote uh, in uh, the Senate race in Arizona and Nevada uh, and uh, Wisconsin, as well as California. But we say, no, you can only pick one state where you are a resident. Um, so there are certain criteria that we think of as um, generally acceptable. The one on felon status is much more contested, uh, as is uh, you know the question, as I mentioned earlier, about voting rights for people who live in United States territories. We have you know a kind of second class citizenship for these people. I don't think that's justified. I think we much harder to pass an amendment with um, enfranchisement of people on from the Virgin Islands and Guam and these other territories. Uh, so I I separate it out. But I do think my own personal view is those people should have the right to vote. But I do think that um, having limitations that are consistent with how other countries do it, like not allowing fourteen year olds to vote. That seems to me to be reasonable. So it's not a universal right to vote, uh, but it's a right to vote as recognized in most of the world. Yeah, so since you brought up a couple of times the, the territories and, and you think that that residents should have the right to vote, um, are, are they required to register with Selective Service at this point? Do they pay U.S. income taxes? Um, would would you know they be required to do those things that people that are born in the continental U.S., Hawaii, and, and, and Alaska are required to do? Well, let's first talk about Washington, D.C., uh, which is part of the continental U.S., uh, and uh, thanks to the 23rd Amendment, which passed kind of uncontroversially uh, in the, the 1960s, they have the right to vote for president, but they have no representation in Congress. They have no senators. Um, that makes no sense to me. So this is an easy case. They are paying federal taxes. They are subject to the Selective Service. I think that's an easy case. For these others, the first thing I would say is there needs to be self-determination for the people living in these states. And they have to decide, do they want the full package where they are uh, considered the same as people on the US mainland in terms of their rights and responsibilities? There are some differences in terms of treatment of taxation, in terms of, um, uh, I believe they, are, they do have to register uh, for the selective service. Uh, but in terms of uh, other obligations under federal law, do they want to be their own country? How do they want to be treated? But if they decide that they would like to be treated as equal citizens, then they should be entitled to have a vote. And I talk about some ways of doing it. I mean, some of these places are very small. We wouldn't make them U.S. states. How would we count their presidential votes? So there are some creative well, ways to deal with that. Yeah, and would there be environmental laws that we apply here in the U.S. that they would have to adhere right. to? I mean, because... Um, it seemed to me it'd be hard to just isolate voting and not say that the whole package of, of um, what it means to be American would come into play. Oh, I absolutely agree with that. But I think the first question is, do they want to buy into that package? And I think if the answer is yes, then voting should come with that for sure. All right, uh, Rick, let's, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, state election control because one of the advantages of states having the degree of control that they do is, if there is a dispute, it can start at the state level for resolution. States uh, were actually, you know, counties are largely responsible for the counts of, of votes currently. Um, potentially, they could have less power, but same responsibility, but less power as a part of this amendment. How do you see it affecting local jurisdictions and states if this amendment were to be passed? This is such a great question. Uh, so just to underline the premise of your question, when we hold an election for president, we don't hold a single election. We don't even hold 51 simultaneous elections. We're holding over 8,000 simultaneous elections, mostly at the county level. And here in LA County, we're in the largest election jurisdiction uh, in the country. Uh, hold, you know, our, our LA County is larger than many states in terms of how many people are voting in that election. 
In an earlier book I wrote called The Voting Wars back in 2012, uh, I advocated for national nationalizing our election administration, the way it's done in Australia and Canada and other places. And uh, uh, this uh, is such a non-starter. Uh, this is something that is so uh, resisted. And it's not just a Democratic Republican thing. People on the local level and on the state level do not want to give up their power. Uh, and some have made the argument, for example, if you think back to the risks of election subversion in 2020, uh, some have made the argument that uh, what saved us uh, from the election being stolen was the fact that we did have decentralized power. So there was no election czar who could have been manipulated by a you know federal government. But putting that aside, in this proposal, in my book, I am very emphatic. I think I say it five times in the book, this is not a federal takeover of elections. It would still be administered under state law on the state and local level. There would just be obligations to provide, for example, um, reasonable access to voting. And I, I give you know, a much more technical definition of that. But what one rule of thumb, for example, is people should not have to wait more than 30 minutes on election day to be able to vote. I mean, that is kind of a benchmark that uh, a, a presidential commission came up with uh, after the um, 2012 elections um, that uh, we, we, they wouldn't necessarily say every state has to offer ballots by mail. They still have the option to not do that. But every state would have to give meaningful voting opportunities. Maybe that means some early voting in person. Uh, so it would require that voters have access and that voters are treated equally. But it would not be a federal takeover elections, and it would not micromanage how, uh, other than requiring registration uh, and identification of voters, it would not mandate how states or localities run their elections or what voting machines they use. Would this ban voting ID at the polling location, which you know many states are are doing, in which uh, public opinion polls shows relatively popular with Americans? Sure. Well, it would replace that with a national system of ID. And if a state tried to put in an additional check, then it would be subject to being challenged as being overly burdensome. So, so what would the person present when they come in to vote? They just give the number. Is that it? Because how would how would what would keep people from using a phony number? Sure. So there would be a just like today, if you go into a polling place in um, Los Angeles County, there are poll books. They can look up your name, your address, your picture would be digitized there. They'd be able to compare your picture. Uh, it, it, another possibility is to optionally give voters a chance to provide some biometric information like their fingerprint or the, an eye scan. There are lots of, you know, as technology is improving, there are lots of ways that we can easily identify people and it would, you know, it, it wouldn't be uh, so easy to just present someone's number. If you just use like a social security number, there's no uh, um, photo associated with that or anything like that. But there are, you know, there are lots of ways that we can identify people. Uh, but uh, I, I, this kind of system, I think, would not be in place until we assured that we, you know, we can do so without burdening voters. It has to put all the costs on the government, as opposed to today, where in some states it's really hard to get the right kind of ID that would be acceptable in the state. Um, and you know, we should say too, if you if you don't have that right kind of ID, it can be hard in many different ways, healthcare and and education, all kinds of different things. And it, it's always it's always baffled me why we haven't made a big push to help everybody have ID because if they don't, voting is just, you know, that's an every couple year issue. There are day-to-day -day issues that impede people's ability to function without ID. And we don't really hear about a push to, to make sure that people have the documentation they need. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. And it would have a lot of collateral benefits if people had these IDs. And I should, I'm going to give a shout out to a group called Vote Riders, which is a nonprofit that goes into states that have strict ID laws, and they help people actually get their IDs. I mean, some of the stories of like the Holocaust survivor who couldn't get a birth certificate because she was born in a concentration camp, or the person who was in, oh, I think this was in Wisconsin, she was denied um, uh, a, a waiver, uh, uh, an indigency waiver, because she couldn't sign because she lacked uh, working hands and had to go to court. I mean, so, you know, these are the kinds of things that, uh, you know, unnecessary burdens. We need to be able to identify voters to prevent fraud, but we have to put the costs of that not on the voters because, you know, for most of us, you know, those those of us, uh, you know, who drive, uh, those of us who are a little bit better off, 
we don't have trouble with IDs, but it's, you know, it, this has a disparate impact on people who are poor, people who move around. Uh, these are the people who are most likely to be disenfranchised. But let's, uh, before we go to viewer questions, I know we're going to have some great ones as we all always do, um, but we have to get to what is uh, the elephant of the room, and that is how in the world would this ever have a chance of passing? Because as you write in your book, uh, when Democrats controlled both houses of Congress and the White House before the people in the John Lewis Act, both that dealt with voting rights, were not able to be passed. So how in the world would you meet the kind of threshold required for a constitutional amendment? Yeah, it's a great question. I start the book out saying that if you're skeptical, that's good. You should be skeptical because let's talk about what it takes to pass a constitutional amendment. You need a vote of two thirds of each house of Congress and approval by three quarters of state legislatures. We haven't passed a new constitutional amendment since 1971 uh, when we passed the um, uh, 26th amendment, which uh, uh, makes it um, uh, illegal to discriminate on the basis of age between 18 and 21 years old for voters. Um, We've lost our muscle memory. We don't know how to do it. So how to think about this? I, I have two responses. Number one is uh, we can't think of this as a short-term thing. This is going to be a long-term movement. And so I mentioned the case of Minor versus Happersett. That was the case in 1874 where um, Virginia Minor was denied the right to vote because she was a woman. And the Supreme Court said, this is a question for states. Well, look at what happened after that case. They, uh, the, the women's suffrage movement organized state by state. And they fought for voting rights within each state. So by the time you got to the um, 1920, to the passage of the 19th Amendment and its ratification, over 30 states had changed their state constitutions to allow women to vote. I see the same kind of long-term process here, which brings me to the second point, which is that this is not a one-shot deal. Either it passes or it's a failure. The whole process of seeking this is provides a movement to raise attention about voting rights. And maybe along the way, that convinces Democrats, for example, to blow up the filibuster for voting rights, which I've been calling for since 2018, pass it with 50 votes, and put through the John Lewis Voting Rights uh, uh, Advancement Act, put through other voting rights legislation. So I do think that uh, we, can't, we can't think of this as just about whether this passes. And the, the other example I give is the Equal Rights Amendment. It didn't pass in time. And yet it has provided, raised people's consciousness about issues of discrimination uh, across genders and it raised people's consciousness. And I think it improved things even though the measure itself did not pass. So you're not concerned if, I, I know this is not the topic of tonight's uh, conversation, you're not concerned if the filibuster um, was done away with, we'd be whipsawed back and forth without the moderating influence that that the filibuster has. We'd be going from party to party extremes, um, lurching all the time. So the, the um, Senate has already made exceptions to the filibuster for reconciliation bills, for budget bills. That has not caused us to be whipsawed. It has already made exceptions for judicial nominations and for executive nominations. I would make another exception. And I think, honestly, uh, when Republicans control all of the branches, they may just as easily get rid of the filibuster entirely as Democrats uh, would do. So I don't think the filibuster is long for this world as, uh, as we're going along. I think I would start with the narrow exception for voting rights legislation, but I recognize that we're in a situation now with a very polarized electorate. I actually think in some ways it would be better if you're whipsawed. You know what that means, Larry? It means that there's more accountability. So Donald Trump comes in, Republicans get rid of the filibuster, they control both houses of Congress, they enact a, a lot of programs, and if they're not popular, people vote them out, assuming we can still have elections. If Democrats come in, they can actually get their program through. What do we have now? You know, Biden blames the Republicans, Republicans blame Biden, and people don't know, there's no accountability because we have this presidential system that doesn't really match our polarized politics. It is a topic right. for another day. I took I took us off course, but I just, uh, it, it's always such a such a dynamic thing to debate. Eric in Los Angeles says with with pandemics and, and people's disabilities, um, bad weather, jobs making it difficult to vote, should it be enshrined that everybody has a right to vote by mail via uh, mail-in ballot? 
So uh, I think mail-in ballots are a complicated question. Uh, on the one hand, they greatly improve convenience. Uh, on the other hand, not only do they present more of a risk of fraud, although a generally smaller risk of fraud, we do have modern examples of fraud committed with absentee ballots, including that 2018 congressional race in North Carolina, where the, yeah. the Republican, um, uh, uh, his operative engaged in uh, uh, messing with absentee ballots. Uh, but also, it, even if you're in California, if you vote by mail, you're more likely to be disenfranchised because inadvertently disenfranchised because people make mistakes that are not easily corrected. You forget to sign your thing. You don't fill it out right. If you're in the polling place, there's much more of a chance of error correction. Uh, and so uh, especially uh, in states where there has to be a signature and the signature might have to match. In some places, you don't get the opportunity to cure if some bureaucrat says your signature doesn't match. So I'm not in favor of a universal right to vote by mail. I am in favor of easy access to voting. A state that wants to say people who have an impediment to voting uh, in person should be able to vote by mail, absolutely. But if they want to have in-person early voting, that's fine with me, so long as there's one, easy access. One of the things I like about in California, uh, in and uh, I'm not sure how many of the counties do this, but you can you can get certification that your ballot was received either in a drop box or by mail and that it was counted. And it's nice because if you don't get that, then you know something's up and and hopefully there's time you can you can show up in person. Yeah, and not every state does that, unfortunately. And not yeah, every state nice... not every state gives you the right to go and correct your ballot. It's, um, it's a nice feature. It's... Uh Paul asks about the Electoral College, which you do take on in a real right to vote. So please elaborate on the reasons why you'd like the college to go away. So in my basic amendment, I do not propose eliminating the Electoral College. I do say that within each state, it should be up to the voters of the state to decide how the electoral college votes are um, allocated. So this would reverse what the Supreme Court said in Bush versus Gore, that state legislatures could take this right away for future elections. One benefit of that besides pr promoting voter equality is to make it harder to steal elections. We didn't talk much about this. We talked about the, the political equality benefits, the lowering of election litigation, but I also worry, especially after 2020, about stolen elections. And so even if you want to keep the Electoral College, giving voters the right to vote would help. Now, I'm not in favor of the Electoral College. So one of my add-ons would be eliminating the Electoral College. And a, a corollary to that would be eliminating the Senate, uh, the, uh, the rule that every state, regardless of uh, population, gets two senators. Uh, I would change that to be more like the House, where we under a, a, a one person, one vote uh, type rule. But there have been lots of books that have been written about eliminating the Electoral College. I think that if my amendment has any chance of getting some bipartisan support, including Electoral College reform is kind of like a third rail and it would kind of it, it, it would well, derail the whole discussion. And as a practical matter, we, you know, we have this increasingly polarized country where uh, the urban centers are are fairly aligned, fairly homogenous politically, and rural parts of the country who, who have the greater uh, proportional representation through the Electoral College and through the Senate are hold a very different point of view. If you did away with the Electoral College, how would you keep the urbanites with their more homogenous viewpoint from running roughshod over the rest of the country? Well, you know, this is why we have a constitution that protects people's rights. You know, the you know, for example, the First Amendment. Uh, it protects people's rights to religious liberty. It protects people's right to speech. So we protect minority rights in certain ways through uh, our Bill of Rights. Uh, in uh, legislation, the idea that the way you're going to protect minority rights is giving them over-representation, to me, that's anti-democratic. That it's fine. If you're going to have an anti-democratic aspect of things, let that be in the courts and let that be in the courts protecting rights, as opposed to weighing people's votes differently. So why should it be that, you know, a, a small state like um, Wyoming or Rhode Island or Hawaii should have the same power as a California or a New York or a Texas or a Florida? I mean, think about why well, should... they don't have the same power because the House of Representatives 
California swamps other states with the number of, of representatives that they have. So, so it really isn't the same. It's, this, it's the Senate is, is what tempers that dominance that a state like California has in the House. Yes, although, you know, we didn't really talk about partisan gerrymandering. It's an issue I kind of bracket in my book, but it's not as though the representation in the House is accurately reflecting simply, uh, you know, population. Uh, it would be, you know, a very different kind of system if we had, you know, true proportional representation. Again, I'm not advising that in the book, but if we had a real proportional representation system, you know, everyone can vote for, let's say, Democrats get, you know, 52% uh, uh, of the votes and Republicans get 48% of the votes, we could allocate our representatives in that fashion. It's a very different kind of system. Okay. We're not going to switch to that. Uh, and I'm not advocating for that. Uh, we have a number of people who've asked about the right of states to disqualify a presidential candidate. Do you think that's constitutionally sound? So this is the pending case that um, the Supreme Court may decide any day. And this is the case whether Donald Trump is um, disqualified under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which says that uh, certain people who uh, had served as an officer of the United States and taken an oath uh, to uphold the Constitution, if they later engage in insurrection, uh, they're disqualified. This is a very difficult case, uh, a very difficult case legally, factually, and procedurally. Legally, this is a part of the Constitution that came after the Civil War. We don't have a lot of experience with it since the 1870s. So there are a lot of open legal questions. For example, you know, does it apply to the president or not? There's uh, you know, there are, there are some textual arguments about that. Factually, what does it mean to engage in insurrection? One trial court in Colorado said that Trump engaged in insurrection. Is that going to, you know, bind the whole country? What does insurrection mean? Do you have to be charged with a crime? There's a federal crime for engaging in insurrection. Um, he wasn't charged with that crime. That's not even part of the charges that he's facing in Washington, D.C. And then there are procedural questions. Uh, who's supposed to decide this? At the oral argument, in the Trump versus Anderson case uh, at this one out of Colorado, it seemed like the Supreme Court was not going to disqualify Trump. It's not clear exactly how they're going to do it. I actually filed a brief in the case with Republican lawyer Ben Ginsburg and election professor Ned Foley. We didn't take a position on whether or not Trump should be disqualified, but we said it's important for the Supreme Court to weigh in definitively on whether or not Trump is disqualified. Otherwise, voters might be wasting their votes on a disqualified candidate. And the very worst thing would be what if the Supreme Court says, this is really a question for Congress. They can resolve it on January 6, 2025. So imagine Trump wins and Democrats control the House and Senate. They, are they going to say, well, you know, Trump's disqualified. We're not going to make him president, even if he appears to have won the election. It's kind of a recipe for disaster. So I'm very worried about where this case is going to go. Well, and David, uh, our viewer said that you recently wrote about potential grand bargain with the Supreme Court where Trump would be able to stay on the Colorado ballot, uh, but uh, the appeal uh, to uh, his presidential immunity claim um, would, would be turned down. You think that that's a likely result? So in the immunity case, that one is up on an emergency stay from Donald Trump. The briefing was completed last uh, Thursday, I think. So we'll get a ruling at any time from the Supreme Court as to what they're going to do. And they have a few options. They could stay the, the uh, lower court proceedings and then hear the question of whether Donald Trump is immune for the actions he took uh, that, that uh, you know, are alleged, the alleged election subversion in 2020. Or the court could uh, decide not to issue the stay uh, and let the case go to trial. And so the fact that we haven't heard anything yet makes me think that the court is going to let the case go to trial and somebody's writing a dissent. Um, I, I don't know for sure. That's just a guess. But if they were going to set the case for argument, as they did with the Trump versus Anderson case, the disqualification case, they probably would have announced by now that that's what they were going to do and set a quick schedule, which is what they did in the, in the disqualification case. I don't know. But it does seem to me that there is, this is not a legal point, but a political point. There's some uh, maybe parody to this idea. Look, we're not going to take Trump off the ballot. We're not going to let states do that one by one. But voters will be able to know through a trial whether or not a jury believes that Trump actually engaged in these kinds of crimes. So maybe that's what's going to happen.
Larry asks a two-part question. First, couldn't overly permissive voting rights allow serious abuses, such as vote harvesting, eternal ballots coming by mail to people who've moved, died, et cetera? And, and who under federal law would be able to check signatures um, as, as the basis for voting? So it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be that uh, there would be no like federal officials that would be involved in voting. We'd still do the same thing that we do on the state level, but they'd be able to check this identification that would be created. On the first question uh, about ballot harvesting, I mean ballot harvesting is just a pejorative term for the collection of absentee ballots. Um, uh, this was uh, what we saw going on uh, in that 2018 North Carolina race. I'm not a fan of California's law that allows for the unlimited collection of absentee ballots. I'm, I much prefer Colorado's law that lets a person collect up to 15 of these ballots. I don't like the law in Florida that says that only immediate family members living in the household can collect ballots. So states have different approaches to this, uh, balancing what they say are their concerns about uh, integrity versus access. I, I, my amendment wouldn't speak to the specifics of how a state would do that. It would just say that if voters could show that whatever the rules are overly burdensome, then they could get a court order to prevent that. But states would still be able to take steps to make sure that their elections are being conducted with integrity. All right. Uh, and in California, there there is no limit, is there, on the number of ballots that someone can collect and turn in? There is no limit. And uh, I think that's a mistake. Uh, not because we've seen actual abuse in California, but because we know there's the potential for it. And it's really not necessary. It might be necessary. I talk about this in the book. It might be necessary for certain communities that don't have easy access to the mail. Again, uh, Native American reservations, uh, there are examples where people have to travel over 100 miles to get to a post office. Uh, and if they, uh, you know, they don't have access to a photocopy machine. So in those places, I think the, the laws that would prevent the collection of ballots could be burdensome and probably would be unconstitutional as applied to them. But most people have access to a mailbox or, uh, ac uh, you know, or, uh, you know, if you allow people to collect a reasonable number like 15, that, you know, there are ways that we could solve this without opening the system up completely to, you know, the complete collection of these ballots. I, and I want to ask you about the the concerns about voting fraud because I, I I feel like this has gotten very binary in the way it's talked about. So you know we often hear from from Democrats, people on the left, well, there's no evidence of voter fraud and and you know all these sorts of efforts are are about disenfranchising people and then people on the right. Well, we've had in Georgia more African Americans vote in the last election with the changes in voting laws than they ever have history. So where's the evidence that that this is dis disenfranchising people? So I wonder if you could speak to this issue of sort of potential abuse versus evidence for something because because often when we don't have evidence for something, it's said, oh, it's disproved that there's voter fraud or we, you know, we don't have evidence of it. That's not the same as disproval because it's difficult to prove a negative and it doesn't mean in the future that it won't potentially be a problem. Sure. Uh, yeah. So I think that uh, there's, there's a lot more heat than light on the voter fraud, voter suppression idea. So let me just give kind of my, my five second overview, which is that um, the amount of voter fraud in this country appears to be quite low. Uh, there was a concerted effort after the 2016 and 2020 elections, for example, to look for non-citizens voting. And uh, I believe that in 2016, when Donald Trump claimed that there were 3 million um, non-citizens who voted, there were under 30 cases. There were under 30 cases nationally that were prosecuted. It was like 0.0001%. Now, of course, not every case is going to be caught. But people were looking for it and very hard to find. And it's actually in a larger election, like a statewide election or a presidential election, very hard to get enough people in a conspiracy to engage. So now maybe election officials could cook the books, but we have other protections to prevent that from happening. But voters doing it on a large scale doesn't happen. You know what it happens is in small elections. You know, I wrote years ago about an election in Cudahy, you know, small little towns in Southern California where there's not a lot of, uh, you know, the LA Times is not there. LAS is not down there, you know, uh, in every day. That's where, uh, you know, and where 50 Ber votes could decide a race. Vernon Ber Ber is another example where we had this kind of fraud, where it was really like 10 votes was enough to swing the election because the population is very small. So there is voter fraud. It's very rare. And it doesn't generally swing big elections. 
voter suppression is exaggerated, but there are, I give actual examples in the book. So for example, Kansas enacted a law that said you can't register to vote unless you provide documentary proof of citizenship, like a birth certificate or a naturalization certificate when you register to vote. We know that that law had stopped 30,000 people who wanted to register to vote until a court put it on hold and then struck it down. So there are laws that actually can be disenfranchising. Do I think that, you know, anytime any state, you know, Georgia passes this law and the Democrats say, this is the worst law ever, you know, the, the you know, you can't give water to voters. Um, I, I don't think that most of these laws are disenfranchising a lot of people, but part of that is because these laws provoke a reaction. So if you start requiring ID, then people mobilize to get IDs. And the question is, why do they have to put all this effort into doing this if fraud's not a big problem when they could be putting that effort into get out the vote efforts or other things? Uh, Amira asks, uh, and we're almost out of time, so real quick response, please. Why do you think people distrust vote by mail more than distrust uh, voting machines? Donald Trump. He, uh, he really made vote by mail, which we had during COVID, uh, really uh, accelerate. Even in 2016, Donald Trump was not really against vote by mail. He votes by mail regularly. Um, so he's the one that railed against it. And now we have that concern. And with voting machines, there are concerns about voting machines too. And the solution to that is transparency and auditing of, of um, systems. And we have good ideas in place for how we can assure that humans can double check the counts of the machines. And Christopher asks real quickly, what about having a national holiday that's the voting day, everybody votes the same day, and fewer people would have to work? Well, unless we're going to have mandatory voting, I think it would be an excuse for people to take vacations and uh, for mattress sales, like President's Day is. Uh, <laughs> I much prefer a voting period, because if people can't vote on that particular day, or they're working, or they're out of town, it would be a problem. If we had a two-week voting period, I think that would be a, a, you know, a good national policy, even though I wouldn't make it a requirement under my proposed amendment. So, Rick, a chance for just a brief closing comment from you about uh, voting rights, particularly in this presidential election year and and what you think is in store in in uh, in those issues in this year. Yeah. So, you know, I, I often when I speak to, to groups that they walk away a little bit uh, discouraged or depressed about the state of voting in our country. And uh, I do think we're facing a lot of challenges. We didn't talk about the election of officials who have been leaving office because they face threats and uh, you know, threats of violence and harassment on social media. There's a lot of work to be done, but people are, I think, aware of what the issues are and people are not uh, being complacent. And so the message I would say to people who are concerned, because we have a decentralized system, there's lots of places to try to make a difference. Uh, even here in California, there's a lot of ways that you can volunteer, that you can support voting rights uh, at home uh, and in other places. And so don't think of this as a, a reason for despair, but instead as a, a call to activism. Professor Hassan, it's always a pleasure. And I look forward next week, you're going to be with me on our Air Talk program on LA 89.3. And I look forward to uh, continuing the conversation next week. Thanks so much. Thank you. These were great questions, and I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Our viewers have so many great questions. And if you're one who took part, Thank you so much. I'm sorry we don't have time for the for the many, many questions, so many great ones that come in. We try and, and give a representative example of, of some of those great queries. And I also want to thank you for your financial support for Jews United for Democracy and Justice, which puts on these programs as a service, of course, at no cost. And I encourage you to please make your contribution by visiting the website JewsUnitedForDemocracy.org, where you can make Make a tax deductible contribution to help support these programs, America at a crossroads. Next Wednesday, five o'clock Pacific, eight Eastern, it's my good friend Pat Morrison in conversation with political analyst Bob Shrum and Mike Murphy. I know it's going to be a hot hour talking about all things political, including California's U.S. Senate race, a look at what's happening with uh, elections in the House and in the Senate, and of course, the presidential race. That's with Pat Morrison hosting the conversation, moderating it with Bob Schrum and Mike Murphy. Thank you so much for joining us on this Wednesday evening. From all of us at America at a crossroads, good night.